This is for Sarawak. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, disclaimers lah, I guess, at the beginning. <coughs> and introduction slash disclaimers. I think we had a, a good introduction of everyone here already. Okay, yeah. Disclaimer, I'm a lawyer by profession. Yeah. Right? So I don't profess to be a scientist, but I've been trying to learn, especially about this area lah, mostly genetics lah, yeah, in the past one year. <coughs> and uh, lawyer by profession, but I'm unemployed at the moment. I'm a, I'm because It's because I'm a grad student. <coughs> in Budapest and so this is the, this is specifically the area of my research and <coughs> the working title is because it's still a work in progress I haven't really um, pinpointed exactly how my research is going to go at this point it started out in one way like a year ago but it's taking a different direction now and a lot of things that I thought that I was going to do before I decided to either let go or push them further somewhere else <coughs> so yeah I'm a PhD student so it's flawed, it's not perfect knowledge, and I was hoping that there'll be some scientists as well who can also help to give some <laughs> feedback. But you know, the best part is having people who are not familiar with the area to be able to give me some feedback. So it's more like a sharing session. Sure, sure, <coughs> so because I'm a lawyer, I'm looking at I'm looking at mainly the legal and ethical framework. Uh, genetic interventions refer to anything that has to do with the manipulation of genes. The enhancements of genes, even uh, for curated purposes, like right or what we call the therapeutic purposes, the non-therapeutic purposes is actually what we're focusing on in my research here. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is actually a specific form of reproductive technology that's used with IVF. Everyone knows what IVF is, right? So it's for people who have difficulty conceiving but they use this technology together with IVF. I'll explain to you a little bit after this what it is like, right? <coughs> so what is specifically PGD? Because PGD is the focus of my research, right? Okay. It's basically embryo screening. When it's IVF, IVF is non-coital um what's that word? Reproduction. Right? So the conception takes place in a test tube or in a petri dish or whatever you call it, lah, right? And the thing that um, with PGD is that it has raised a lot of questions on ethics. Now, ethics is a really huge part of it <coughs> because there's so many moral questions. And, you know, I think it, it like, <laughs> quite consistent with this group as well or, you know, some religious or crypto-religious sentiments have been arisen uh, uh, also, lah, right? But this is the process of doing screening on embryos before they are implanted into the woman's uterus for conception and things like that. Actually, I should use the word conception for maturation, right? Okay. <coughs> and the reason why PGD is carried out is because they want to determine the genetic makeup of the embryo like, before they transfer it over. And for the reasons why, uh, we'll look at the next one. So, like. what did PGD stand for? Uh, PGD stands for pre implantation genetic diagnosis. Okay. There is something else called PGS, pre-implantation genetic screening. Okay. So that's different from PGD because PGS, which is actually carried out quite a lot right now in many fertility clinics, is screening, just to screen normal people. Like people who get married, they want to screen whether the embryos are healthy or not before they implant. PGD is more specific because it targets <coughs> known chromosomal or genetic abnormalities. So if one of the partners, the husband or the wife, have a known genetic disorder, what PGD does is to actually screen the chromosomes for that particular disorder and then look at the embryos, so they'll take a few lah, right? And then they check which one has it and which one doesn't. So the, a, lot of the problem, a lot of the problem comes because the embryos, once they check it, the ones that it has or show signs of abnormalities or defect, then they'll throw away it. So that raises a different question. Lah. Does it have a moral status in embryo? Okay, never mind. <laughs> and the ones that are more or less healthy then will be, be implanted. But then again, like with any other reproductive technology, right? It doesn't guarantee a successful pregnancy. It just guarantees, it just tells you that, okay, we know we've screened for this disease or this usually they call it an X-linked chromosome disorder mm. coming from one of the X chromosomes. We can only tell you that we've screened this disease, this embryo doesn't have this disease. So we implant it to the woman. But whether she can carry it to full is a different question. But then the point that there is a DNA uh, defect in that particular sequencing, right? That's a 
suggests that there might be a defect does not guarantee that it manifests as a disease when the baby not yeah right? exactly that so doesn't it as well just says uh, you have a predisposition to having a problem yes but it does not guarantee it doesn't mean that you definitely yes will have a problem so you could be born with that defect or that sequencing but you live life with without you may be able to develop. yeah so currently what PGD is being used for to, to screen for is actually very serious like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia things like that lah not like your normal okay la, one or two defects kind of thing okay. but we're talking about like trisomy 13, 18 and 21 which is like down syndrome okay. kind of stuff right. so this is relatively serious type of genetic abnormalities lah uh, and this is where it's already known so if you don't know then you can't screen for it you see and the other thing with PGD also, right, is the fact that um, you can only screen for one or a known genetic disorder, but it doesn't preclude what happens when there's other genetic disorders that you don't know about. And also some, some criticism as a reason because it takes a sample, right, from the oxide, um, but it doesn't, like, that sample may not be representative of the whole cell kind of thing, yeah? So that's essentially what PGD is, but in, on paper it looks really good lah. <laughs> it looks really good and, you know, yeah. <laughs> Oops. Okay, so I thought that I would show you guys how PGD works. Oops! Okay, how do I go back? Oh, left, left uh, arrow. Left arrow. Okay, let's think. <laughs> is this a question? Oh, so, oh yeah. <laughs> we didn't copy the... Uh, There's a link file. Yeah, yeah link file. I think it's linked to something, isn't it? Oh, uh, is I don't know. I because I. Is it your time drive again? I thought it'd be cool for you guys to see it because yeah. then it explains. Ish. Okay. Uh, yeah, this casual, it's my house. <coughs> no, oh, no. Oh, is it a different format that you can't play it? Oh, yeah. maybe because I copied maybe. from the Mac. Is you it? Copy from Mac, or do you want to show from yeah. the Mac? Yeah, uh, sure, I can show you. What's the. What, where, where is the farm? Uh, yeah. My farm is this one. The video might be in a yeah, separate, separate video? place. You're uh, just copying the link. I have no idea. Because it was all inside oh. that one file only. But what, what, you know the, 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 what's video? the name you know of the video? video? Because I'm sure you attached the video from elsewhere. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but what's the name of the video? Uh, okay, let me see. Uh, I have no idea, you know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Okay, why don't I just show it to you on my laptop? Is that okay? Yeah, ah, 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 okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why not? Why not? It's a short one. It's yeah, not too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyway, it's a small clip, so we can just put it down for everyone to see. Yeah, except for the video, so too bad for the video, guys. Right? It's not good. It's too... It's too... It's too... It's too... So sorry. I think this is sometimes when you transfer between... Yeah. Mm. I don't know, the, the programmer can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I put here so everyone can see lah. Right, sure, sure. What is PGD? <coughs> I will put the volume. Do you have to the like the same as mini USB, USB, right? Same as me. Mini USB, right? Affected Correct. By yeah, lah. Yeah, put in my. Gene diseases such as those that are due to changes in the number of chromosomes. This is performed in embryos grown in vitro on day three of development. The diagnosis of single gene disease is made using the technique of polymerase chain reaction, PCR. It is necessary to biopsy one or two of the embryonic cells, which need to be placed in test tubes containing a solution that will nice the cell, liberating the genetic material for subsequent examination. <coughs> After the amplification and sequencing of the gene region for analysis, it will be determined whether the embryos are affected by the disease. The gene diagnosis of numerical or structural anomalies of the chromosomes is performed using the technique of fluorescence in situ hybridization, FISH. It is necessary to biopsy an embryonic cell and fixate the nucleus <coughs> on the slime. The nuclei are hybridized in the lab with special fluorescent probes to determine a few regions of the chromosome. In 
this manner, the healthy embryos can be differentiated from the affected ones. That's it. Okay. But there will be another one, so I will just leave okay. this here yeah. first. Okay, so from I'm looking at this from a legal perspective, lah. Okay, and these are some of the main problems that we have with PGD. The first of which is regulation, lah. Right. So it really depends on um, whether you believe that this kind of area of techno science should be regulated by law or not. There is a lack of regulation. Just to share a very interesting fact with you, um, PGD is actually quite extensively carried out in Malaysia. <coughs> Yeah, there's actually a website that uh, lists down a uh, graph with success rates, and then uh, it actually this doctor's name as well, and he's been in the business for like thirty years, you know. And actually, the reason why I realized this was because his clinic used to be near my house, a fertility clinic, and I used to see all these ads that says, "Oh, you want you want a boy or a girl? You can guarantee." And how they do it is PGD. All right, I see. Which is comes to the this part here, disguise for sex selection, which is actually illegal in some jurisdictions. It means you basically look the embryo to see if it's a female or a male, and then if you want a boy, you throw away the female embryo, so. And if you want the male, then you implant the male embryo. Is for people who are doing IVF? Like how do people go go through this? No, no. So, but. I mean, but so, the option is there lah, it's open lah. I guess it's sort of like presented as a well with a tray of stuff. You need to pick two. Uh, maybe, <laughs> if you don't know how to pick, then maybe <laughs> like here's a checklist that you can use rather than... Yeah, that's why it comes down to here lah, regulation yeah, enforcement. Yeah. Because there are countries that have actually prohibited PGD specific... China. China is a different ball game, lah. China okay. does everything. So, no, because because this kind of sex selection thing is kind of it will be big in China. I tell you. There there might be a lot yes. of underground business going on in China. Because because of the single child thing, everybody want boys, what? Yeah. That's the next thing. That the, the next slide that I'll talk to you guys about is really interesting in yeah. terms of China as well. Yeah, okay. That's what you I know. Know. Uh, but yeah, coming back to regulation, so part of my research actually also will ask la, is regulation the way to go? I think ultimately I'll have to say yes, because I do believe in legal enforcement. La. There has to be some kind of enforcement to make people accountable or liable. And there needs to be, I don't know, I believe la, some kind of limitation and guidelines. Uh, sorry? Could you explain later on, like, uh, what regulatory uh, yes. stuff is in place and yeah, I will. Yeah. So uh, problems, the discarding embryos one is because of the whole moral status argument and does life begin at conception or is the moral status afforded? I don't know, has life begun yet at 36? I think that's <laughs> 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 You know, I like to tell myself that, that, that you know, since I started going to the, this research, I'm like, you know, not young as well, right? I'm late 30s, and I'm like, I think my life is only beginning because I feel like I'm suddenly finding something I'm interested in doing. Like, okay, anyway, never mind. <laughs> so the disguise of sex, I say disguise because I think the the, the the hard fact is that people do use it or rather misuse it, lah. You know, for to family. You know, family balancing is that a, a justified reason? I don't know. I mean, yeah. The other thing is savior sibling. They call it the savior sibling dilemma. You have a kid. To save another kid. Something like kidney breakdown on the elder one. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, something like that, right? I mean, uh, you guys, did you did you read this book or at least see the, the movie My Sister's Keeper? No. But I've heard of those now. Yeah, yeah so basically, the parents had a second child uh, and harvested all her stem cells to save her eldest sister who is having some kind of, I think it was leukemia or something lah. And because you know the, the stem cells are actually very, very rich, right? And then the younger child who was being harvested every now and then uh, sued for emancipation from her parents. Mm. I think she was like fourteen or thirteen or something. But it sounds like a fiction, lah. But it it really does happen. Mm -hmm. Many cases in the UK where they've actually uh, they brought the cases to the the, the European court because they wanted to have the right to do this. 
cannot remember the name of the case, but it was an Indian couple. La. Yeah. And uh, this is the most the most um, important one, I would say, but it's also the one that raises all the whole science fiction questions. Germline genetic interventions. Germline is basically your sex cells, where germline means that you can pass down your genetic information to different generations. Somatic cells are just concentrated cells with maybe mutations or whatever, la. but germline means that you can pass it on to your future generations. So if I modify something in my germline cell right now, let's say um, a particular defect, la, right? Okay. It means that once this defect is cured in me, in my cell, my future offspring will never have this defect anymore. So that's your germ cell, germline cell thing, la, right? It raises other questions as well. What if you enhance? Can you enhance? Should you enhance? And right? create the perfect human race. In that sense, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like science fiction. Coming, coming, coming. Okay. So coming to whether or not okay. genetic okay. information can you change the landscape? Right? Uh, there is a new technology called CRISPR Cas9. CRISPR stands for this long scientific terms about how your DNA repeats its sequence. Like it's clustered something isolated palindromic <laughs> repeats. It's basically how your DNA sequence repeats and Cas9 is a particular protein. La. Now this particular technology is not really that new. It's actually been like more than a decade old. But wow. it's own but they've been a lot of testing la, right? And you mean printing your yeah. it's actually using this particular technology. What it does it is I will show you the video after oh, this. Okay. It's an editing tool for DNA. You're photoshopping your own DNA. You're basically cutting. Oh, cutting. Cutting maybe defective genes and replacing them <laughs> with healthy genes, or allowing the the natural process to to kick in and and you know manifest oh. itself. You see. Now, this particular technology is the subject of a huge patent dispute in the U.S. right now uh, between the so-called creators. Jennifer Dudna is one of them. She's from I think UCLA, and then there's another one, Chinese person from MIT, Fengjiang or something. But the video I'm going to show you is the MIT one now. But it's super interesting. I, I chose the, the one that I think would be easiest to understand, long, right? So it's in the middle. They're in the middle of patent war right now with regards to CRISPR Cas9. But it's supposed to be so revolutionary, so fast, um, that the whole scientific world has gone nuts about this. Like every day, there are at least 50 to si every single day, 50 to 60 working papers published about CRISPR. Every day. Wow. So this technology is really moving so fast. And you know, I just read like uh, okay, this is more like the scientists can probably explain this better. I'm not really so sure how to explain this, but we always see CRISPR as targeting the DNA, um, but lately they also found that they can target something else called the RNA. Okay, I don't know how to explain it. I was, but anyway, it's supposed to be like quite cool also lah. <laughs> but bottom line is, it's CRISPR is supposed to be pretty awesome lah, right? Okay, I'll, I'll show you this little video about CRISPR. <coughs> Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome, over 20,000 genes, 3 billion letters of DNA. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health. And thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, researchers have identified thousands of genes <coughs> that affect our risk of disease. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy, but recently a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system 
used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, researchers studying the system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the pan. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut, but the repair process is error prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. Oh, this is so cool. Yeah, it is, right? That's, that's it. Yeah. Okay, so that's CRISPR-Cas9. And interestingly, right, I mean, it's been around for a bit right now, 10 years or so, but they've only conducted trials on monkeys, dogs, Animals love, right? And last year, the Chinese, <laughs> the, Chinese yeah. the Chinese attempted to work it on a human embryo, although it was a non-viable human embryo. So the whole scientific community went nuts and started condemning them. Going back to earlier, I, sh I showed you about the germline genetic thing already. Because once you use Cas9, to modify certain parts of a human embryo and then you implant the embryo when this embryo reaches its sentient state or becomes a person eventually, right? and this person reproduces you're carrying that whole genetic, that genetic modification yeah. right? Okay. now CRISPR when it was first conceived it was actually just to cure diseases so the idea was to treat genetic disorders. That means if you follow, if you watch the video, it cuts that defective gene and then the RNA is supposed to be like some kind of messenger that carries some DNA, the genetic information, it's supposed to repair itself using the, the protein called Cas9. So that was the initial outlook. My research goes a little bit further to ask what happens if you use Cas9 with PGB. So instead of just screening for a known genetic abnormality and, we, and because PGD is essentially just throwing, choosing embryos but with this CRISPR right now, you can actually target the embryo's genetic information. So should you take it away 
which is quite different from just discarding the embryos and not implanting them. So should you work on them now, whether you want to enhance it or whether you want to just remove certain defects. Because what really is there to stop um, stop us from proceeding now? You know, I don't know, but you know, I thought I, I've asked myself this many this question many times. If there was such a technology available, and if there was the possibility that I could, I could um, enhance my child, right? And the question arises: I don't know if I would do it. But why wouldn't you? Yeah, it's it's natural to want to have so, a yeah, okay. healthier child. So it depends, lah. I mean, chance of survival, right? So naturally, you would my first question would be: Is it safe? That's the first question. Risks involved, and uh, I mean, these are the practical questions, lah. So I'm, I'm moving away from the yeah. legal, lah. I'm thinking about just the even the more practical type questions: Is it safe, and how 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 is this going to affect the person in the long run, lah? So I think my primary concern would be safety. Whether I should do it or not, it comes from this whole. Then this is where all the other things like religion, cultural, uh, social upbringing, all these comes into play. See, so that's also part of my research. No, because in some sense it is really giving your offspring the best chance of survival. So right? should you? Girls used to, women used to choose men, or men used to choose women the for their, their best gene. So this is just another way of selecting a gene, right? So you okay? So brings. Briefly to the next question, is it a form of eugenics? Um, <laughs> but my only, my only issue with it is the consequence is overpopulation and issues like that because it used to be natural selection. Some people taking selfies, go Pokemon kill themselves, right? That <laughs> wipe out a, a lot, right? But then, so then there's, but then with this, it seems to imply if you have a genetic effect, you can pass it on or get rid of it. Yes. It will be a, it will lead to a large and larger population. Correct. And yeah. It, I think it's that kind of uh, whatever. But yeah. then, um, but yeah, you should be passing on your best gene. It's the human race. It's not even best. You are mod- you are manipulating. It's not it. just about passing on the best. You know, it's about whether you should use it to and modify it. Yeah. Advance. Yeah. Now the thing is, you have the ability to change it. You, can, it. you yeah. would exploit it further to enhance it. That's that's I think that's what's yeah. So your that's, argument, isn't the, it? that's the main the main thing. I'm yeah, yeah. It's not about whether I should pass on the best genes. I would pass on my best gene, but the question on is whether that, whether I would do something more. <laughs> Yeah. You know, whether I would do something more like, I don't know, change my daughter's skin colour or an eye colour or like give her a certain kind of Super brains Yeah, intelligence, athletic abilities Because all these not? are genetically the thing is, targeted we could Individually you would want it, but if the technology falls into the hand of everybody and everybody were to start doing it the whole world, imagine the consequences of the future then What is the consequence? There I'm not sure, that's why nobody is sure. Okay, that's, so, where, that's where the, so the consequences, I'm thinking, just consequences, I'm thinking if let's say everybody does this is first of all is access. Yeah. That right? How much is it gonna cost? And if it's going to be costly, which I presume it will probably be, yes. does it mean that it's going to create a social inequality? So we're talking yeah. about a genetic caste that might actually rule over the rest of us Monday. Secondly, so Indian, right? so Secondly is right? Yeah, they discrimination law. Discrim- yeah. Issues yeah. of discrimination. As it is, discrimination is a huge issue already. But now you right? have a genetic advantage, so it's a totally different ballgame. Of you're course, smarter, yeah, the, you're stronger, the, the, you, know, you can live longer. Yeah, those who obviously oh. are proponents of this could say, what, we already have discrimination, so take away the social problems and then you take away the discrimination. It's a problem that's going to be around here anyway, so regardless of whether you have genetic modifications or not, there's always going to be discrimination, so basically you can't do anything about it. Lah. I think your first point is very valid. Access, and the other thing is Access. disabilities, lah, right? Uh, people with disabilities, or like, uh, there are many cases, for instance, where deaf parents, they, I mean, I've, I've, I've come across these cases in my research, where deaf parents had the opportunity when they did IVF to to consider the possibility of having an embryo that is doesn't have deafness also and they, they don't want they want the child to be deaf also mm. so that raises another set of questions who makes the decisions who decides what is in the best interest of the mm. child we always think that as parents we know better mm. as a parent myself la, i will say I, I i know what best for my mm. daughter but the question is do i really right you know mm. 
So, <laughs> so this okay. I'm, so this is coming to my research lah, right? And just sharing you what my research is all about lah. My research is basically I'm looking at the uses of PGD at the moment lah, and whether there's any form of genetic interventions and how it can impact the use of PGD lah. I look at regulations. Is there any regulations? So this is where you're asking me about regulations, right? There is an European Convention on like biomedicine and uh, and human beings. It's called the Oviedo Convention, but it's a European convention, right? Okay. So from a, from speaking from a, from a international law perspective, our region, for example, doesn't subscribe to it. What is it? Uh, there there are some some specific uh, parts of the law that prohibits. Um, modification of germline cells. Yeah, so that's what some of these conventions do. And then there's the World Medical Association. They have a declaration called the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, it's but it's not law law. It's because it's by the World Medical Association. So it's just like I said about guidelines for doctors lah, right? And about what their duties are. Genetic modifications is in in these instruments are always about you can't do it lah. You can't do it if it is germline modification, right? And then uh, in Malaysia, for instance, I'm trying to look and see what there's if there's any form of laws regarding PGD. IVF is a, I think they're in the process of formulating some kind of laws for IVF. But other than the Human Tissues Act, and there's the uh, the guidelines of the Medical Council in Malaysia, there's really no law law. I think, in my opinion, yeah, that's what from my research, that's what I've done so far, lah, right? So what I'm trying to say is that should we be looking at law to help guide us how we make decisions about the use of genetic interventions in PGD? So I have to start with PGD. I have to start with the uses of PGD and what are some of the controversies with PGD and then I have to move into the genetic interventionist part and to see how that ties in with PGD and then I look at frameworks now uh, I don't know this part might be a little bit boring because it's more like constitutional law but I also look at constitutional law to look at types of frameworks uh, the French has a model kind of, uh, a kind of framework where it's kind of like a revisionary thing like so every like five years or so, they revisit the laws to keep up to date with technological advancements, right? Uh, Cass Sunstein is a is is uh, it's a it's a lawyer that I will be looking a lot at because he proposes he talks a lot about regulation and framework in this particular types of fields lah. And I personally think that regulation should be the way to go. I mean, I start by asking a bunch of questions which everybody knows the answer to at the end of the day lah, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm going to, my, my opinion is that yes, we need to have some form of regulation. What but are the alternatives if not regulation? If, if not regulation, I think then the, the question is how are you going to make people accountable? Yeah. How are you going to, to allow access? Yeah. How are you going to ensure that there is equality and uh, equal bargaining power, there is non-discrimination, there is privacy, yeah. you know, because the exchange of genetic information there's also it also raises, raises issues of privacy, right? Um, so yeah, um, Cass Sunstein talks about the the necessity of a regulatory framework, but he also talks about the fact that a regulatory framework should be also subject to how the particular nations or states um, policies have always been like. So you know, initially I really wanted, I I still think about it, but I put here model framework in Malaysia because if, if I mean obviously I'm from Malaysia lah, right so I would like to be able to, to see some kind of framework I don't think it's at the list of political priorities at the moment obviously <laughs> but I think this could be something that, that really is important in the future lah, right and you know part of me was being very ambitious and thinking if we could look at the ASEAN region and to see if we can impose some kind of framework within ASEAN at least, lah, right? Um, the way the, the European Union, of course there's all these problems with the European Union right now, but in that in that kind of framework, lah, right? Then we can't be too quick to jump on the gun and say like, okay, I'm going to legislate against this, 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 this immediately before anything has really happened just yet. Lah. Because then, you know, repealing laws and all, it's, it's going to take, it's a process, lah, and it's going to, it's going to be, um, 
quite quite time consuming. So I think it's it's about finding the right balance between legislation and between uh, what happens in society, what are the views of people, what's the policies of the country like, and I think this is quite important, which is why I will look at it also in my research, is your religious aspects. I have no choice, but I think it is pertinent in this uh, in this research, lah, in this particular are there, research. Are there other sorts of things that we ratified uh, like, or that where we need to fall under the uh, legal framework? On? So say, for example, if we ever like WHO, do they have any that we are obliged to? Uh, not particularly. It depends on the treaties and whether you've ratified those treaties and whether those treaties have become part of your law. Because, okay, of course, internationally uh, internationally speaking, there are certain types of uh, treaties that will be imposed regardless of whether you sign those treaties or ratify them or not. Lah. And those will be in relation to particular things like, say, genocide. Right? It's what we call... Uh, no, no. Uh, yes, juice, juice cogents, that means it's like, it's like absolutely cannot. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing, lah, you know? But... So those things can be imposed by customary international law, regardless whether a particular country has actually signed the treaty or not. But this is not one of those areas, unfortunately. Right? So I'm saying that this research is important, right? Um, and my focus is on the human aspects, actually the human rights context, right? Uh, so like I raised earlier, I my concerns are with um, failure siblings. My concern is with uh, and, and, and uh, the rights of the child and uh, how the rights of the child are being treated, best interest of the child, blah, 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 that kind of thing. So for, from that aspect, more you know, like a family aspect, uh, including parents as well. Uh, do parents have the right to make decisions for their children in this respect? Uh, I, raise, I will probably raise questions of autonomy, personal freedom, and this kind of things, like which kind of tricky and then there's this other thing this word that starts with D it's called dignity uh, dignity of the person uh, what uh, a lot of people call it the personhood argument la, right? if you are a person how much um, free will do you attribute then there's this other thing I read about free will not being free will anyway but let's not go there la, right? so wow. I'm looking at the specifically human rights framework so savior sibling disabilities Parental uh, decisions, autonomy of the child, autonomy, is etc. Um, I look at, uh, I have to look at parts of the moral arguments relating to embryos. Uh, I will look at issues of privacy. Uh, there's actually quite a lot. Yeah, it's so quite a lot. It's discrimination, disability, uh, women's rights, reproduction, reproductive rights versus... Uh, your cost benefit analysis of having this kind of technology, la, right? Uh, I will also look into this, has already been done a lot, so I will not go into a lot into it, which is the germline cell intervention part. La. There's so much literature about this already, right? But a lot of my arguments will be in relation to PGD and genetic interventions. La. So I, I have to use a lot of these other literature, but I hope to formulate my own conclusions in this respect. La. So anyway, this is the boring part, la, but these are the questions I will ask. Is law the best to, what's the role of international law? Can we actually have international law? This, and uh, what are your challenges? Uh, this is where all the so socio-economic, cultural factors, policies, uh, international trade, industry drives, economic uh, factors all will come into play. And what kind of legal models are there? And Maybe can we take best practices from these models, lah, right? I've chosen these jurisdictions. I don't know if they're going to be changing at some point of time. Malaysia, obviously, because I'm from Malaysia. But you know, when I when I give my presentations in <laughs> in uni, I, I have to come up with a reason why. And my uh, I'll tell, I can tell you guys now. Mm -hmm. I say Malaysia only because I'm from Malaysia, lah, right? I mean, which person who does a PhD would want to do a research or comparative research if it's not with their country, right? So, so. The <laughs> why Malaysia to you guys because I'm from Malaysia we're all Malaysians but to the other community that I do presentations to it's because Malaysia is in a unique position <laughs> <laughs> and in a in a in a unique position 
<laughs> to, to put itself at the front of this kind of interventions because of the fact that we have a dualist legal system. Uh, yeah. Okay, very good. What's a dualist legal system? That means we have uh, a legal system that targets, well, that is applicable to, we have normal laws, oh, right. okay. and then we have Sharia laws. So that, I think it's quite interesting uh, because, I mean, if you look at, at some of the, I think you cannot take away reproduction from some religious undertones, right? Especially, what, what do you see in reproduction as, la? right? Okay, so that's why, that's, but I think it's, yeah. <laughs> I chose the US because of, uh, well, also because, okay. I have to choose the US. <laughs> <laughs> Funding? Because, yes, yes. <laughs> no, but also because it's a, it has a good lot of uh, literature. Like, there's so much literature. Your developers of all this technology, most of them are Americans, mm. like, right? Okay. Berkeley, MIT, so all these fellas like Harvard, all this, right? The UK is because it has very special and quite cool laws that have allowed a lot of stuff that maybe some communities may not think they have recently allowed a three-person IVF. That means three people can be recognized like you you get your genetic information from three people. Not just two. So three women. No, I don't understand. Yeah, how is that work? You need so, a sperm, you need an egg, so... So you get a donor sperm. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Certain, this is called mitochondrial DNA donation. So there oh, are certain, okay. yeah, it's not like the the whole egg lah. I think okay. From what I I know, scientists please do not kill me for this, right? But I think what I understand is there is some women have a defect. In, mitochondrial. Yes. The, the yeah. Producing cell. Correct. Yes. So they get other women to donate that to them, and the UK allows this to happen. So what happens in this one particular case was these two women, one of them who was going to carry had the mitochondrial defect or something, and the other one, I don't know why she wasn't going to carry the baby. They got a donor sperm already, so they got someone else to come in and donate mitochondrial DNA here. So effectively, you're looking at three parents la, in that sense. Yeah. And the UK has also got very specific legislation and a licensing authority called the H, the Human Fertilization and embryology authority that actually licenses PGD in certain instances. Lah. So it has to be for medical reasons, like for example, this embryo has an X-linked disease, then if you carry it to term, the baby will come out like super cha or whatever. Lah. Okay, I know I should have used that word, super cha But you know what I mean. Lah. <laughs> but basically, very serious defect. Lah. So it's only for what they call medical reasons. Lah. So the HFEA is the one that issues all the licenses. Uh, they actually have quite good guidelines uh, to the clinics. You know, they have regulations. Uh, and that's under the purview of a law that's been made called the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act in the UK. So are they the most advanced in terms of the regulation? I would think that the UK and Australia, Australia are, are quite advanced in terms of regulations. Lah. Like Australia is another one that I've looked at. I think it's really interesting because they have federations as well. They've got different, different, all these different states, which is similar to the US. So we're more close to the, um, to the UK so far as legal, legal regulation is concerned. If this is a regulation, at, at, at yeah, level. yeah. Well, so the US and Australia is actually federalism, federal, federated level, and it's actually very strong elements, but. There's also all these leeway that's given to the individual states to make regulation, you see. But of course, it raises very difficult constitutional issues, lah, right? If there's a if there's a clash between, let's say, federal and state legislation, lah. But so far in the US, there's not been any federal legislation, but there's been a lot of guidelines at the state level and cases and things like that. So it hasn't really come up at the federal level, and I think people. Oh, and a lot of them didn't even know they were sterilized. They were just told, oh, it's just some medical treatment by, by the state. They were sterilized. So mm. many, many states in the in the US have actually done this. They actually did this before Hitler. Hitler actually got the inspiration from them. Mm. How did they do it? Like It was forced sterilization. That's a form of eugenics. They didn't kill people, la, but they sterilized yeah. them. Like out, oh, like they cut off something. Yeah, yeah. 
so that they can't reproduce. The guy have kids. Even in Japan, right? Is in the forties, yes. Yeah. In Japan, in the forties. Yeah. That's also in my first chapter. Yeah. So I mean, I know, so these are these these are uh, stuff that I raised I in my the, first the chapter. The thing is, it it starts off so cool because it's a technological innovation. That's like, wow, this is so amazing. But then actually. That's just the technology part. Now it's like the whole lot of ethics is. I think like the ethics part is something that that's going to be really hard to cover so because there's so much. Yeah. There's really so much uh, ethics involved, and yeah. I think this is where I'm going to do some some cutting, lah. You know, like I've got to be able to choose certain areas. That's a thing I'm still struggling with: what to put in and what not to put in. I think the problem with doing a research like this is that you kind of want to. Put everything you think you can do everything, but then you really these people out there have studied for twenty years. I'm trying to do it in three. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So anyway, chapter two is where I actually map out the frameworks, the different frameworks from the different jurisdictions, um, relating to PGD, relating to genetic interventions, and then I will kind of tie them together, or rather hope to tie them together. And then chapter three, I look at best practices. Chapter four is where I raise all these ethics and social. Social challenges, lah. So I will raise things like religion. I will raise culture. I will raise、uh, public policy, political priorities,、uh, industry drives. Because some, like in Thailand, for instance, reproductive tourism is so strong over there that if they don't have this, the economy, it it takes a huge chunk out of the the economy. I recently did.、Um, Uh, I presented a conference on reproductive tourism in Thailand,、uh, perpetuating or having the possibility to perpetuate embryo trafficking.、Mm-hmm. <coughs> Because yeah, anyway, that's a different matter. Is there matter, such、la. an industry in Malaysia? Like reproductive、uh, tourism? Not that I'm a reproductive tourism is your PGD, no? But do foreigners actually travel into Malaysia? Not so many, lah, as Thailand, but there have been some. There have been some. But if they are, they are mostly from like Hong Kong, Taiwan, where it's not a lot. Yeah. But、uh, this is like Thailand has a lot from America, from Europe. Because it's not out there.、Mm. Yeah. And、uh, so chapter four will be all the stuff, all the cool stuff, which is actually going to be my favorite chapter. Favorite chapter, I think, because it's going to be all the cool stuff like Gattaca. Oh my God! I can't wait. I can't wait to read your thesis. <laughs> I, 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 there's this part in chapter four where I raise about weapons of mass destruction and bioterrorism. I just watched that chapter yesterday. Oh, yeah. I don't know. My 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 supervisor thinks it's a bit far fetched because I'm talking about super soldiers and how you can. What happens if genetic modification allows you to build a perfect army? Yes. And then you know, like threats of war and things like that. And then of course there's all these.、Uh, Bio like bio weapons lah, bio terrorism weapons lah. We only have a lot of that stuff for anthrax lah. What is the a great new world countries? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that kind of stuff, and then I I also raise like what happens if people could live forever? Not I mean you know, fountain of youth lah, kind of thing. Or if there is a way to significantly um extend your lifespan. You can't maybe not live forever, but to extend your lifespan. Because if you remove all your genetic abnormalities and live with like natural, in the natural way lah, minus all these things lah, like risk for cancer, diabetes, things like that, can you possibly live longer? No, but then the boat has kind of sailed for us who have been born, right? Because the <laughs> the gene is in every single cell. Okay, so I can't just change the one, the tiny one on my cheek here. The rest of my body doesn't. Get the message. The cool thing about、okay. CRISPR is that it can be done on living persons as well. How? But how? Because、sure. the gene is in every single cell, right? So I cannot go and print it all over. So、me. I guess that's the the challenge, lah. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying so. Yeah, you know, like this is very cool, and this news just came out yesterday. In China, in Chengdu, this lab just got approval from their board to conduct the very very first. CRISPR trial on a human being next month. Wow! Lung cancer. Oh my god!、Yeah. This is、and、the first、so、in the world. We're gonna live forever someday. <laughs> We're gonna live forever. So this is actually they're they're very excited, but of course during this period before they actually carry out the trial, they're going to have to measure certain doses of how they're going to 
uh, use the technology lah because I think uh, what it does is it will insert then they need to think about doses and they have these 10 people lah who basically everything is filled for them already yeah, that's right. you see so they gotten the approval on 6th of July so recent to conduct the CRISPR trial next month so, so I know it will be quite interesting in one of your lists of uh, I don't know, that's the thing. I might modify the list as I move along because as I, I start reading a lot more, I realise that China has done so much cool stuff. Yeah. And you, <laughs> cool stuff! <laughs> and they have uh, a lot of political will and money to yeah. just yeah. execute. So yeah. they might be the forefront of technology. I think it oh, really yeah. is. I don't know, like... Uh, okay, yeah, might, it's I, like I, even, even if the whole world bans it, but China... Yeah. Just China's gonna say it, I don't recognize the internet. Hey, I'm sorry, yeah. okay, this is totally out of topic, but you know recently there was this lady who was supposed to be like the Notre Dame, and she recently passed away. Yeah. She, I can't remember what her name was. She was like... I think she was a Sharifa something. But she was... Not, not Malaysian, I think, but it was... She was supposed to be like one of the Notre Dameers of our time, lah. Mm -hmm. So her prediction is that in this age now, China is going to be the one that rules. So <laughs> looking at this, not not too far fetched. Not too far fetched, lah. But anyway, so yeah, so I might I might um revisit some of the um jurisdictions that I look at also. I might also actually look at Thailand, I don't know. How many years in have you? I'm in my first year. You've covered so much in your first year. No, I, this is just my research outline. I've only covered the eugenics part. Oh, okay. Yeah, the eugenics part, but the rest is still have a long way to go. So in terms of methodology, right? Because like, uh, you, you, you don't run at regular experiments. No, I like, probably will do like comparative law research. Oh, okay. Uh, comparative law methodology. There is some human human sciences methodology which I probably will have to use as well. Um, you see, part of my plan coming back to Malaysia was to try and meet up with this doctor that does PGD. I haven't yet. Uh, I've called, but he's always busy. So the thing is, I don't even know how I'm going to talk to him. Like I haven't formulated a way that I want to talk to him because I don't want to feel hostile. Yeah. But I also want to be friendly enough that he will be willing to talk to me for research purposes, you see. The other two people I can think of was the girl, the other two people to speak about Okay. is the CEO of uh, Cancer Research Manager. Okay. And she looks at the BRCA1 and 2. Uh, yeah, two. yeah, I've, um, I've read about this. And she's doing a lot of research here on that. They want new funding, European funding, for doing more. They have new 5,000. Uh, people to run it on something like that. Yeah. So I don't know if she's going to add any value. Okay. Can I guys sit in the middle and we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, the camera is just going to have our discussion. He was oh. like uh, on the other also about uh, gene. Um, uh, this was all about uh, pre genes and. Uh, the predisposition for certain yeah, for certain types of diseases, uh, Yeah, that was what you're talking about. So all this goes back to the uh, engineering kind of questions. Yeah, and right the BRCA right. genes, la. Oh, the, yeah, the, the BRCA. So if you do want to, I, I wouldn't mind yeah. actually. Uh, yeah. yeah, and there's a group in the uh, UN uh, that does a lot of uh, research on under the gene. Under Dr. Chaya, is it? Maybe I know Azalina or someone like okay. this here. And uh, they do this big gene for genes campaign, but uh, they do a lot of research for it. It's like quite active faculty. So I can look up just. I don't yeah, know, okay, they'll be awesome. Maybe they know how to get to the doctor, or I don't know. Or yeah, know so else. this is. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just. Yeah, yeah I'll, 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 I'll okay. add on Facebook and then we'll okay. then be in touch and stuff. So, yeah, a big part of my challenge in the past year has been about understanding. <laughs> The science behind it, lah, which is, uh, mm -hmm. which is, I, I always find very fascinating, lah. So when people ask why this particular area, I said, I always say it's because of my, you know, my failed ambitions to become a doctor slash scientist. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But are you, are you, uh, will you be looking into epigenetics? I don't think I can. It's it's too broad. It's too broad, right? Yeah. This is like kind of like the in thing. Yeah, space. it's too broad. Uh, 
I, I think there's so there's so many other things I could look at like cloning and stem cell therapy for mm. instance these are also other issues that crop up with this kind of topic you see? Yeah. but I cannot because it's just too much because DNA is only half, half of I mean, Correct. I mean, it's I mean, only half, half of the story half of the story there's another layer of the on yeah. top of DNA is called uh, epigenetics, epigenetics. Oh, right. so it, it, it kind of like regulates how the gene is expressed so in a way, let's say if let's say your parents have one of the parents have cancer and stuff like that, but then I don't know what happened along the way when they passed. Like you even though you have that cancer, you don't get you don't DNA, get yeah. But the epigenetics on top of it will suppress it. You know I mean? So the epigenetics is changeable. DNA is non-changeable, something like that. Yeah. Right? Then you can't change your DNA, but you can and you have the potential to modify your epigenetics. The thing is, like only recently I found out that. And this is something that I never knew about myself. Like I carry some kind of thalassemic something lah, you know. But I don't I don't have thalassemia and I never exhibited thalassemia. And so I did like some full blood work. I think it was because I was going overseas and I needed to do like a full medical and then the doctor told me I'm like what? But this is where epigenetics comes in lah. And it's yeah. like wow. And then there there are members of my family, like my cousin, who has thalassemia. And her husband coincidentally also has or carries the, the, the you know the defect or something like that, and that's why they don't have children. Mm. The last time we were discussing this, right, um, we were sort of making an analogy with building a house. So your DNA is a blueprint, of, uh, uh, effectively. Then you have your civil engineers, or like the builders, right, and they will execute the building according to what they see on the blueprint, right? They follow the map. But I suppose what you're saying is that even so, if I have a crooked corner here, technically I will build that crooked corner because I'm just the builder, right? The construction guy, right? I'll be like, oh, right, okay, I, I can't make any decision on this. So you want it crooked like that? Yeah, okay. I mean, then it's crooked, right? But I guess then there are also the other clever independent <laughs> inspectors that walk around going, hang on, I know it says it's meant to be crooked, but I don't think it's meant to be crooked. So I think that's the layer. Yeah, that, that's that, 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 where so even though it's in your blueprint, it doesn't necessarily manifest itself when the protein gets built, I think. <laughs> this is very cool because I'm actually currently reading this book by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Uh, and uh, he talks about, he, that's his exact question. Why are some genes suppressed or if mm-hmm. you're carrying certain defects? Like in his, in the case of Siddhartha Mukherjee, it's the family mental illness and his family members all got mental illness and he thinks that he might be he might actually get it la. so his book actually uh, I haven't finished reading it yet but it's like super fascinating so far it's about he, he calls it the history of heredity or something like that like the gene right and so he raises questions and asks questions about why some genes express themselves and some don't so that's what I haven't gotten to that part yet la. Yeah. I've been I've been reading this book about epigenetics, but I give up halfway because it's mm-hmm. so tough. It is quite technical. It is yeah. very very tough. I cannot understand a lot. But of I have to tell you that this Siddhartha Mukherjee book. book is actually very e- okay. I won't say very easy to read, but it's it makes for okay reading for people who have no background yeah. on science or genetics. Because this epigenetic thing is like a memory, you know. Like they did a test on the rats. Okay, mm-hmm. they sound some bells. Okay, and then. The bell will signal some pain, some pain thing on, on the rats. But then when the rat pass on the genetics to their to their offspring, right? It it, it, it happens that they pass on the sound of the bell to their offspring. Right? But how could you pass memory down? Oh. You, you are passing DNA down, but how can you pass? Yeah, yeah. So all the third generation and the fourth generation, when they hear the bell, they run away. Mm. Of all the rats, you know. So the dog, that's epigenetics. You can you can how uh, manipulate epigenetics at your level and then I don't know how it comes over. It can be passed on. Can you pass on epigenetics? I'm not sure. They say you're supposed. Okay, I read it halfway. You're not supposed. You can't do that. Mm. When 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 they form like sperms and and yeah. the yeah, eggs, yeah. the whole epigenetics yeah. memory is quite well yeah. clean. Correct. It's but there are some. Yeah. But there are some elements inside there that cannot be worked. I don't know what is that. They are so that oh, okay. Okay. So they are like quite uh, perplexed until today. They cannot figure out how can they pass the memory of that cell down to the generations. <laughs> yes, I don't have all the answers yet. Yeah, yeah. Not yet. yeah, not yet, not yet. But it's 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 a it's a thing like when you're talking about it or something. Uh, okay, epigenetics might might you know you might be 
something like you. And then it, I mean, like I don't know, like but there are some things you always say. Oh, that's like for example, like I, when my my daughter likes to listen to a certain type of music. Yeah, that like, that oh, that that's is really not my that. daughter lah. It's like yeah, that that's well, my yes. daughter. Like you think like these are things that you shouldn't be able to pass down, but it happens. It happens. You know. Yeah. And then like I rationalize, oh maybe because I listened to it when I was pregnant or whatever stuff like that. But then there are other things that I cannot explain, you know. No, but it's also a chance because uh, not all your children like the same music. Why? Why do you identify with yeah, the one? But only because I got one lah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, it's a bias. Yeah, like yeah, the one who doesn't, you don't say. Bias. Yeah, yeah. The one who doesn't like your music, you don't go. Cannot be my cat side. Don't like your music. <laughs> But then for this one, you do that, so it's like a bias, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, how did you choose to go to um, Budapest? Oh, because they gave me funding. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Wow, you got the funding for it. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. In Hungary, yeah. you got the funding from The university is called the Central European University. Wow. But you're not, you're not from... This like oh, okay, you're from a law, lawyer background. Yeah, so I'm so from a legal yeah. background, so... Fish press. Yeah. And I really, I really applied for European uh, scholarships as opposed to UK because first of all, the UK got so many problems with the. Right. But like this was like <laughs> really in the end of two thousand two thousand fourteen, I started applying at the end of two thousand fourteen. I wanted to go to UK, but I didn't want as well because of cost of living, and then like at that time, I already heard about Theresa May. Oh. Okay. She made a whole lot of statements already, and I'm like, I don't want this to be a problem wherever I am, right? So I started applying to European universities. So I applied to three places. I got rejected by two, and this one accepted me. So I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay lah. Back to back, go go lah. Yeah, it's a beautiful city. Hungary. Sorry. Hungary. No, like it's quite hard. But they speak English anyway. They speak English. My university is like fully English lah. It's like one of those very cool. Well, we call it the safe space, lah, because there's so many. This it's so diverse, so many different people from a lot of places there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I have three years to finish my research. No, actually, I have six years to finish, but I get funding for three years. Um, but but you of another half year, lah. Uh, so by the way, because you you said you have a doctor or something. Daughter, right? Yeah. So your daughter is here in KL, and yeah. you're there. Yeah. Oh, so the separation must be like. Separation is hard, lah. Very hard. Very, yeah. very hard. And last I saw her was in December, and then I came back end of June, and I hope and then she'll come and see me again in November, December, lah. Oh. But it's because I want her to finish up her school here first, and then mm. maybe bring her over to that. Mm. Yeah. But let's see how what happens, lah. Just like you said that, if we could make super soldiers, <laughs> but you see, if you if you could make super soldiers, right? Unless you you hold the secret to making super soldiers, it's really useless. Because the moment you can manipulate uh, your child's uh, you know looks or whatever, yeah. and everybody has the same chance to do it, your child will not be special, special anymore. anymore. Everybody will just be the same. But I think like the cost is just access. No, it's a, it's a cost. Soldiers, no, when I think of super soldiers, I'm like, what? It's already obsolete before you, you even go there. Like nowadays, they don't use bots. They don't use yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah humans in, in war. Right? I, I I spoke to a soldier before, so uh, you know we were saying, uh, this was during the uh, Saddam Saddam Hussein war, where the first time we saw. Uh, smart bombs where it could be you just target a bunker and not just simply just and then hope that the bunker is gone but they can target that, that particular bunker so we will say obviously say no we will always need soldiers no matter what you say this is legit no yeah, no no it's, 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 you know what, what you say I think about the Afghanistan war you know Afghanistan is so mountainous that robots cannot penetrate drones cannot go in you need human there's the other thing also uh, which is if you are looking from international humanitarian law perspective, uh, the human element, the human element is you know IHL right? It's like uh, whether you kill these people, number of casual casualties uh, based on what kind of advantage you achieve, right? I think a lot of it is still very dependent on people in so in so far as IHL is concerned because there are so many problems raised in IHL because of all these UAVs and drones and things like that. 
which is what the error, the so-called error, can be well. So, so you're saying that they they need to put their error. They might still yeah. you might still need to have some to justify it. some some human element. No, I mean not to make the mistakes that drones make because drones a lot of it is based on algorithms, correct? Yeah. 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 The targeting of the. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's. Nowadays, it's, it's not. No, how do you target? Okay. Now, they have this problem. Okay. Yeah. They are hunting down terrorists in Afghanistan. Do you know how Afghanistan is the landscape? Mountainous. Caves. Mountains and caves. Okay. They cannot achieve it with. They cannot. They cannot even find people in there. So they have to find. They, they have to use people to really go and scout all these places out. That, that's what I've heard. But. Like I said, there's, 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 there's a. Hey, you know Google Google Have Maps, right? Huh? You they, they use people, right, to go and get all your stupid. <laughs> <laughs> they can go travelers. They can go travelers, but but it's not legal. Right? <laughs> they can go travelers, okay? Street view, right? You know, I, I, I get what you mean, like you, mean, right? you use the backpack. Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. But my point to that is, if everybody <laughs> has access to create a superhuman baby. Then there's no advantage, right? So you have a soldier, then it. Yeah, that that's. But that's yeah. not true because uh, I think what everybody cannot you cannot have a whole world full of soldiers. Uh. So what you do is you will say I will create a gene. Uh, this this group of people just like in China, this group will become gymnastics. Uh, this group <laughs> will become uh, doctors. This group will become soldiers, uh, peacekeepers. This lot will become engineers to go and build infrastructure. So it. It will literally be used to create certain skills. That a small person, no matter how superhuman, you cannot have hope. You know oh, this is this is this is very right? cool thing you raised because there's a particular um bioethicist called um is his name Nicholas Agar. Nicholas mm. Agar talks about what he calls it the life plan. So oh, thank you. Mm. That from from the time that we're born, we all have a certain life plan. Whether or not the life plan is our own, or whether it is something that your parents determine for you. So, if your parents think that you have the propensity to become an artist, then they send you for art classes. You know, they want to nurture that talent and all. So that 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 is what Nicholas Allen calls the liberal eugenics. Mm. And mm. and uh, of course, there are all these other people who say, oh, then you are you are you are basically assigning a certain life plan to your child. And not giving them the option, lah. Like, so have you watched oh. the, the the anime, the the ants, where the ant like you know the dog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the cartoon. They are born to be as a worker, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I don't be so yes. yeah. But anyway, that's just have you have you heard about the winner takes all uh, concept? Uh, that's where your uh, your super army comes in. They say that like, okay, everybody can have the access, but before everybody has it, one nation has to find find it first. The first nation that finds it and creates a super army. Is the winner, and when he's a winner, the concept is winner takes all. He will grab the whole. Suffer everything. He will suffer everything before the other nation comes in. So that's a winner. So they will not sit there like, okay, I wait for you. That it doesn't happen like that where everybody gets a thing at the same time. No, one nation. So you're talking about like world domination. Yes, that's a winner takes all. That's the winner takes all theory. Well, if you say that, then I'm gonna counter by saying that it throughout history. There's always there will always be somebody, somebody within who will leak it out. That happened with uh, a, 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 with Britain in America when they had the bomb. They had all these other people who just leaked it out to Germany. Uh, one one nation probably can control the whole world, but then other nation might rise up and conquer back again. So it, 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 it will happen over time. Happen. But yeah, to, today they got. Yeah, I don't know why I'm really thinking of the man in the high castle. But you'll never have like <laughs> 10 nations suddenly have 10 nations have super army all together at once and they will fight. No. It will all be, uh, it will all, most probably be one nation conquer everything and then another nation will infiltrate that information and oh, steal back and they will fight back and then they will. You know, it's, it's like. Like, like no, no, no. Well, when you say, okay, let, let, let's, let's think back and see. America was, was the first country to have the nuclear bomb, correct? Yeah. And within a few short years, everybody else had the nuclear bomb. Once you have it, right, and it's so important that other countries still threaten, they will try and steal it from you. Yeah. Like the shortest way is to steal it from you. Mm. And they will. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So it's, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes you think that oh, oh you know, or oh, this this like you know, when people talk about Iran having a nuclear uh, a nuclear bomb, I'm not worried about it because everybody has it. Yeah, everybody <laughs> has it, and you know that the moment they, they try to do something, somebody else is going to find out about it before they can even try it because we have lived through all these wars before, which mm-hmm. devastated our grandparents, which mm-hmm. devastated our you know ancestors, our countries. But the thing is, now America is a leader of the world. He's number. Yeah, they are number one. Okay. okay, that's what I'm saying. When you have the technology, you'll be number one, but it's only for a certain period. Someday, somebody's gonna take over your throne. It's just like, you know, the, the, the Ganges can't be used to rule like the biggest part of the world. And after that, uh, what, uh, the Rome, the Roman came in, now it's the US. Someday, it's gonna be somebody else who found the super, uh, the super human like yeah. the true, true. And then somebody's gonna take you over, like, there's, there, there has to be one leader of the world. <coughs> They're Usually. Okay. So whoever that finds it first will be the leader. Like and then somebody energy. else will find it and then they will come back. In the energy sector, when you draw where the resource is for oil and gas or whatever, yeah. then you will match it with wealth for an hour. And then when they find a new technology like second, right? And then you get a new source, right? Then when they redraw the map to see where the power shifts. Yeah. So actually, it doesn't mean you'll always be but uh, the yeah. Maybe you all need to get over better, better regulation and everything. Yeah. And more liberal regulation, uh, the Lebanese uh, become the key player or the Egyptians in this, and boom, and then the power. Moves it's a shift of power, yeah. 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 It, will, it will always be. Like, UK used to be like, but no, no, uh, England used to be like the world, the world leaders during the before the World War II. Then America just like you know, take, take over after that. Yeah, Someday China's <laughs> gonna be the, the world leader, who knows? Well, but I find it fascinating that it all starts with this technology which is like super cool. Everybody agrees it's super cool. And then, oh my god, the ethical issues that but, comes yeah. up in that. It, yeah, so because, it, it touches, on yeah that. because it touches human beings. You know, yeah, if it touches yeah. the phone, like, yeah. like a phone, like, oh, you don't have a uh, who cares? Like, you know, yeah. yeah, but when it's it touch human yeah. beings, yeah. yeah, all you need to do, all you need to happen is like, oh, we, we try to engineer this girl, little girl, to be like the most beautiful, but she came out to, total opposite. With three arms, or you know, be blind. <laughs> then, uh, then, then, forget this. This whole thing will be shut down straight away. You know, it's always like that, isn't it? There's, yeah. there's some interesting stuff that I was reading uh, yesterday, right? There's actually chimera research being carried out, uh, and they're actually right. trying to grow organs uh, in animals for human beings. I thought they they grown ears on rats. I saw that. But the, the, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. yeah. I don't want this one. This is kind of. I know it's it's kind of fascinating. It's thrilling, but it's like it's so CRISPR is both like wow, yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's, but yeah. it's like the devil as well. It was a darling yeah, yeah, and a devil yeah. at the same time. Like like before you started talking, I was saying that I think you're gonna be a you're gonna be a huge demand <laughs> in years to come because it's gonna be a big thing and you know, because you are like the one of the pioneers in the field. People are gonna look for you. I don't know lah. Well, hopefully lah. So I hope I get a job lah. <laughs> uh, I I kind of foresee that she'll get one because it will be booming, you know, later part of the year, you know. And then uh, like, who's the pilot? Uh, like in the world, there's only five person. Like no, she's no lah. There's actually so much more. There's oh really? Quite a number of them are really like, quite popular. And and actually, my my supervisor is quite big in the European commu- community. Uh, so she has sat on the European Commission. She's drafted legislation. Poland for Hungary, you know, so oh. and uh, recently it was quite cool. But I got to get involved with this project that she was doing on neuroscience. Neuroscience. <laughs> uh, it's just a very small. I've only attended a few meetings, but it's actually super interesting because it raises questions about enhancing your brain and uh, whether you should be subject to increased legal responsibility and because of your increased capacity. Of Oh my god, that's so interesting. But again, it's like it's not technological. <laughs> oh, I have some questions. Oh, fuck, one is here! And it's already 7 yeah. yeah. But yeah, some, some really cool stuff oh. that, that I, I've hey. uh, had the yeah. opportunity yeah. to participate in. Uh, like. So it's actually very so cool to be there. Cool. Like. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad she's there. Oh, yeah, she yeah. oh, yeah. 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 come back. <laughs> She'll be back because in her list, like Malaysia, can, can you see it? Malaysia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion, discussion. <laughs> hey, this is uh, Junda and this hi. is Pakun. Hello, hi. 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 Nice to meet you. Yeah. 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 
Bala aku sendiri Masa Habis dah lah Baru sampai Aku tidur Aku sendiri datang rumah aku Jom pergi Ya Go 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 ahead Let's go I'm going to ask you Uh, Paku is a, a, a award winning artist But uh, illustrate Yeah, but they call it graphic is not illustrate <laughs> But maybe I also found out We also found out a few years ago when he joined us He's actually quite an expert on uh, evolution and Darwinism Yeah uh, And this is uh, doing that He's also an award winning uh, 3D uh, 3D uh, artist modular. in anything to do with NASA Yeah, and his 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 uh, area of focus is uh, the moon and uh, rocket science. And all the Apollos. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you ask me anything about Apollo, you. Can and the, the funny thing is, they don't speak a lot of English, and yet they know a lot about you know. So someone they will read about the you know, but when you try, of course, there's no article about evolution in Malay. Come on. Yeah, no, <laughs> so, yeah wait, wait, well, you, but we you know in my mind, I have to say I'm, I'm, I was I was biased when I met them because they could, they were always converse in Bahasa. So I was thinking, you know, they have an interest in science, but you know, one day when we were discussing uh, Darwin, then he, he came up with all these other, you know, things that... Uh, he, he can actually pronounce words. Yeah, oh, that we do. The, no, the, 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 I throw it out, uh, the whole thing, he can actually pronounce the whole thing. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Yeah, it, was, it was interesting because she was talking about uh, modifying genes okay. and to produce superhuman beings. Oh, she? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, and she's, she's a lawyer. A, she's a speaker. She's so a lawyer. she's looking at it from the aspects of law, ethics, and uh, so you know what, what she's she's mainly asking whether is it permissible to do it? And and if it's it permissible, is it what, what the, I mean, yeah, is it uh, allowable yeah. by law? Ethical yeah. means is it ethical to do it? Will your son, will your son that you modified the DNA somehow grow up and sue you? Yeah. So you go the MBA and you say, other other people, something like that. That's a topic. Yeah, well, ultimately, I'm... It's modifying the MBA. Wait, wait, wait. Is it, is it, is that really the reference? Is that really the reference? Well, they're going to conduct the first human, human trial next month in China. Oh, shit. So the baby will be nameless? No, 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 it's not a, it's not a baby, it's on a living person with cancer, lung cancer. I bought one. It's yeah. like they um, change the DNA. They, they, want, they cut the, the genes DNA. with the cancer so genes house. and they houses. let the protein repair. Oh, they, they do the level 3 job to remove yeah. so they, uh, the, the bad DNA. Yes, DNA. yes yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, like, you know, this is for human. No, in this case, it's, yeah, so it's to treat cancer at the moment. So yeah. just the, the long span <coughs> with 3 billion uh, whatever, right? <laughs> just that part yeah. that gives the wrong information, the blueprint. Ah, uh, RNA. Uh, yes, yeah. RNA, yeah. See, so, oh, what if I'm in RNA? See, they, they, they would know, <laughs> even though you think. <laughs> <laughs>